Hi, and welcome to another Mass Medic webinar. We have a great conversation for you today. We're going to be talking about realizing the promise of digital solutions and improving patient outcomes. Our sponsor today is PA Consulting, and we have a great group of panelists here with us today. My name is Nicole Owens. I'm the Director of Marketing Communications for Mass Medic. If you're not familiar with our organization, we're a medical device trade association that works to bolster the ecosystem in New England through education, events like this, connection, advocacy, and awareness. I have just a few housekeeping notes before I turn it over to our moderator today. We will have ample time for Q&A at the end of the discussion, so please make sure to put your questions in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen um, anytime you, you have them throughout the, throughout the presentation. And we'll be doing some live polling today, so we'd love for you to participate in that and get your thoughts. This webinar is also recorded, and anyone who registered for the webinar will receive it following the event. With that, I am pleased to introduce our moderator for today, Dean Gray. He is the MedTech expert from PA Consulting. Dean. Thanks, Nicole. Hey, welcome everyone to our webinar today. Uh, I'm Dean Gray. I'm a partner at PA Consulting, where I help MedTech companies uh, to accelerate innovation, uh, bring new products to market and grow. Uh, and I'm uh, very honored to be asked to moderate our illustrious uh, panel experts today. We're very lucky to have Bill Piney of Medtronic, Tom Califf of Active Surgical, and Mel Melanie Turio of PA Consulting. Uh, but before um, I ask them to introduce themselves, uh, I just want to remind you, uh, please um, be sure to ask uh, questions in the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. And we're going to be also conducting a few polls during the chat, and please, everyone, make sure that you vote. So with that, um, I'll get things started uh, by asking our panel to introduce themselves, uh, starting with Bill. Thanks, Dean. And uh, it's a pleasure to be a part of this um, you know, robotics and, and the digital ecosystem of surgery is a, a wide open field and there's a lot of opportunity for us as a community to, to make a huge difference in patients' lives. So I appreciate the chance to be here. So, so my background is, has been in robotics in the medical device industry for uh, close to three, 30 years now. And I'm currently at Medtronic and I'm, I'm leading a technology development center that's focused on how we can use robotics at Medtronic to, um, to support all of our different application areas from neurosurgery to uh, cardiovascular applications, as well as the Hugo robot, which I was very instrumental in, in, in helping to develop that system and get it to market. Um, so, you know, my, my background is that I'm an engineer, an electrical engineer, and, um, but I think of myself as a leader of innovation. I think that's sort of the key piece of, of uh, what I want to be known for and how I want to, to show up. So um, thank you again for the opportunity here. Thank you, Bill. And Tom. Thanks, Dean. And thanks, Mass Medic, for, for the invite here. Really excited to be speaking on digital surgery. Um, I think it's it's great to see digital surgery really making mainstream here um, because it's, it's just such an amazing opportunity to provide a real value to patients moving forward. Um, my background is I've been in medical device for about 15 years now, uh, spanning across surgical robotics, sensing, software, uh, and now currently at Active Surgical, where we're focused really on uh, advanced visualization and how we can make uh, surgery repeatable, uh, data-driven, and really be able to expand it across uh, the world uh, and really aim to democratize surgery through the use of, of intelligent and actionable information. Uh, background is I have degrees in electrical software and mechanical engineering uh, and spent actually about 10 years outside of med tech uh, prior to getting into it. Uh, in industrial and commercial robotics. So again, Dean, thank you very much. I really appreciate the invite. Oh, thank you, Tom. And Melanie. Thanks, Dean. Um, and thank you to Mass Medic for hosting. Um, it's a great opportunity to be here. Uh, I'm, I'm really pleased to be able to be part of this panel. Um, like Dean, I'm a partner at PA in our healthcare and life sciences practice. Um, I head our technology and product development uh, business area, and I've been 
basically focused on regulated medical system development for probably the last 15 plus years or so. Um, I'm a human factors engineer by background and training, and I, I really consider myself to be a human-centered design specialist. So any opportunity I get to think about and talk about how we put the, the human element at the center of what are some very highly technical and specialized systems, um, I really love the chance to do that uh, because I think you know, success for these type of applications that we're talking about, which are very technically advanced, um, obviously depends on also the humans that work in that loop in concert and in conjunction um, with the very, very specialized uh, and advanced technology that we give them to perform a job. So I'm thrilled to be here, happy to be able to, to talk about that and join with my fellow panelists. Thank you, Melanie. Well, with that, we're gonna jump right into it. I'm gonna ask uh, our first question of the panel, and then after that, we'll do our first poll. So uh, first question is, and I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna start with Bill again. And um, how do you define digital surgical solutions? Is it more than surgical robotics? Absolutely. I think there's no question to that. And um, there's so much data in the operating room, uh, in leading, providing information that helps you get to the operating room with preoperative imaging, patient-specific data in that way, as well as biometrics that you're bringing in. Then when you're in the OR, there's every piece of equipment now has um, data that they're collecting usually. And you know, Medtronic has products uh, all over the operating room and e connecting those together provides a very um, rich data set that can really advance um, the, the surgeon's ability to deliver the best therapy during the procedure. And then post-operatively, um, you know, obviously there's cloud connectivity, there's being able to provide um, analytics after the procedure. So it, it, it is truly an ecosystem. I would say it's more, you know, obviously there's, there's devices, a robot is a data collection machine. Oftentimes that's kind of a, a good beachhead to get into the OR and be able to have a place where you can bring all the data together. But it's, it's more than that, right? It's more than just even the robot the, the, within the operating room. It's, it's outside within the hospital and really um, with the cloud connectivity, sharing information as an industry is part of that ecosystem, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. That's great. Thank you, Bill. And, and Tom, you know, from your perspective, certainly looking, um, no pun intended, uh, with the view uh, through advanced uh, imaging um, and helping surgeons and surgical teams to see and do new things. Uh, what's your perspective on this? How do you define digital surgical solutions? Yeah, it's, it's a great question because it, it can be very broad. Uh, Bill touched on the ecosystem. I couldn't agree more. Uh, currently, digital surgery is, is that. It's a true ecosystem that has to really encompass the whole patient journey from patient selection to, uh, to diagnosis to, to surgery to uh, rehab in some cases. Uh, but in surgery itself, you know, we at Active have really been taking digital surgery uh, in that a uh, uh, visualization system has been around for 20, 30 years. Um, so we, we as, a, as an industry, have been digital for a long time. But now, really, what we're doing uh, is, is putting the data side on it, right? So we can now, by, by learning, after looking at so many cases, uh, we've learned that, well, by, by adding new ways to look at light or, or different, different spectrums of light, uh, now we can look at a whole different type of information that's that's available to the surgeon. For example, how to look, you know, through tissues. Um, you know, so if you look at regular white light surgery today that that we've been looking at for the last twenty or thirty years, how do we augment that? How do we augment it not only with with data, uh, but other digital solutions? Again, as Bill was saying, whether it's preoperative imaging, uh, advanced technologies like uh, like what active site provides to, to visualize blood flow and tissue perfusion, um, or really even things like geofencing or, or how to guide a surgery, you know, think of how we get to work every day. I know how to, I know how to get from my house to work. I, I promise it's only 30 miles. I turn ways on every single day because I want to know utilizing the data, utilizing the digital aspects of my life. How do I get there the most optimal way? And, and I think now 
surgery has that capability. And I'm really excited to be able to talk about it. Great, great. And, and Melanie, I'm going to ask you the same question and I'm particularly interested in hearing your thoughts from a kind of human choreography perspective. You know, how does this technology, how, do, how should we be thinking and defining the value of digital surgical solutions, particularly from a human perspective? Yeah, so, you know, I think Tom and, and Bill have both used the term ecosystem, and that's really the right way of thinking about it. You know, there's the the hardware platform itself, of course, um, whether that's a, a surgical robotic system or other kinds of surgical tools or scopes or whatever they are. Um, but of course, you know, it includes all the, the digital components. And when you think about the interfaces there, there's a lot of stakeholders in this system. There's patients, there's surgeons, but surgery is a, it's a team endeavor, right? So there aren't just the surgeons. Mm -hmm. um, there's that operative team around them. And there's, you know, sort of the physical choreography of the, the workflow and, you know, how people move and interact with all of the devices. <clears throat> but that same flow and choreography exists for the digital aspects. You know, there are data streams that are meaningful and important in different ways to the different stakeholders that are part of this. Um, and I think, you know, it encompasses when you talk about digital surgical solutions, we're talking not just about the surgery itself, but, I, you know, Tom and Bill both mentioned pre and post op. Um, I think training for surgeons is a big aspect of this and how we use mm -hmm. the modeling and simulation, for instance, as a part of this overall ecosystem that, you know, we need to think about early in the, the development as well, you know, how we bring people up to speed and, and what those data streams can do in terms of enabling better learning, um, faster training, that kind of thing. Um, and then there's the patient facing aspects of it, both pre and post. Sometimes, you know, there can be, I would argue maybe there should be, um, you know, patient interfaces there, whether they're apps, um, whether it's smooth interface into an EMR, such that patients have better access to their own information, data, understanding uh, about the full process. So, you know, it's a, it's a complex system. Uh, and it includes all of these elements that we need to think about in concert. Great. And, well, and Dean, I, yep. if I can, one, one more idea that I think is important to bring into this is patient wearables, if you will. So, mm -hmm. so um, you know, our, our micro device is collecting a lot of information about the heart as it's beating. Um, our link device is, is measuring um, um, lots of biometric signals within the patient. We have a diabetes pump. There's smart implants that are used in, in orthopedics. So at, that's another source of data that could be pulled in during an operation and pre-op and post-op. Um, so, and I think we, you know, we're, we're heading that way as a society, we're more and more connected. And I think our bodies are gonna be connected as well. That's great, Bill. I've got some other questions. Um... On, on this idea of connectivity, uh, data collection, and, and then how that empowers people uh, to make informed decisions at the right time during the patient journey. But I'm gonna just hold those for a moment and we're gonna do our first poll. Um, and so Nicole, if you are still listening, could you post our first poll uh, to the audience? And then I'm gonna follow up and, and ask the, the panel to discuss, discuss this a little bit more. So our first poll, is uh, how does digitally connected uh, surgery make surgery safer and better? And uh, we're gonna make you pick one of those. And while people are voting, um, I'm gonna ask the panel also to share their thoughts since we can't vote in this poll. Uh, only our audience can. Um, I would like to hear from the panel um, your thoughts on this. Um, what are, what are, what's the value of, of digitally connected surgery? Um, how does it make surgery safer? What are the outcomes um, that it's driving? What benefits do they provide? And uh, um, 
Are we realizing them now or are these all off in the future? I'll, I'll jump in. Oh, <laughs> I great. Think, and I, I'm going to build on what Tom said earlier. Um, the idea, is he turning on Waze or Google Maps? And to me, that is a great sort of um, analogy of what we could do for surgery. As and, and just as Tom mentioned, I do it too. Even though I know where I'm going, I turn that on as a digital assistant to support me because it's it's it it reduces my cognitive load and um, it helps advise me of critical structures, if you will. And, and, and we need the same thing within the surgical field and, and within surgery to provide that digital assistance. And the other piece is obviously when it's, I'm going to a place where I would go maybe once every three months, once every six months, I really rely on that. And I think there's a lot of surgeons who don't do certain procedures that often. And so you're going to see the level of a performance uh, that it will raise the the level of competence across the board, um, and 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 to me, it's getting the raising the entire uh, field of surgery to be and reduce complications and provide better outcomes. Great. So it sounds like from your description, the, a, a key benefit here is raising raising the floor and the ceiling, both of them at the same time. I, I think it's right? possible without a yeah. doubt. Great. And, and Great. I think I think this is happening now. Um, and digital surgery and, and all of the products are going to be a spectrum. It's going to be a continuum of constantly evolving products that have, you know, create new data. So we get to learn from new data and create new products off of it. But I think even if you were to look at uh, maybe some of the most, what I'll say at this point in, in the world, uh, most basic uh digital surgical solutions is in visualization itself. Um, there's been a number of publications showing that identification of structures through fluorescence, for example, mm -hmm. the, the ability to identify a structure during a lab coli uh, saves lives. We know it does. Uh, ACS published it back in, I think it's 2017 um, with the safe lab coli uh, you know, initiative. And you know, there's they, they reduced uh, through using uh, fluorescence during lap coles, I think they reduced bile duct injuries um, almost by, I think almost cut it in half uh, or more. So I think, you know, we, we know that digital solutions are there and they work. Uh, the ability to call out structures that, you know, to, to augment how humans can see, we, we know that, that, that this is a good thing. And now we can build on, you know, the shoulders of giants that have been doing this for, for a long time bringing now, how do we, how do we learn from that? Right. How do we use mm -hmm. that to signal into intelligence algorithms or computer vision algorithms to say, well, maybe we don't even need the fluorescence because it doesn't, it doesn't get everywhere. How do we use other biomarkers or, you know, physiology uh, to, to show these types of structures. And I, I think that's, that's, what's on the horizon is, is really providing, you know, as, as Bill said, you know, that digital assistant along the way. So you're thinking beyond um, fluorescence and molecular imaging um, and maybe even laser speckle flowometry at this point to, to other future modalities as yeah. well. Yeah, those ultrasound, EC, uh, EKGs, you know, the, the, operating, the operating room is full of new sensing modalities, you know, mm -hmm. and even tie in heart rate. You know, if you tie that into visualization or robotics, you can get so much more. Think of the beating heart surgeries that were done in robotics um, over a decade ago. Well, now we have so much more that can be done because we have much better sensors, right? So the, the, the promise is amazing. And, and that's why it's a really exciting time to be part of it. Great, great. And, and Melanie, from a, a holistic or a systems perspective and thinking of, of benefits or outcomes, what are, what are some of the things that we should be thinking of particularly as we, we think about product design and product performance, whatever those products may be. Yeah, so I think, you know, we talk about outcome-based, right? And I think that's, everybody wants better improved outcomes for patients, you know, whether that's shorter recovery time, um, less, you know, post-operative infection pain. There, there's a lot of good things that come mm -hmm. along with the advanced technologies that we're talking about. I think in addition to those, there are also the maybe less tangible patient outcomes, such as, you know, 
better continuity of care across a patient's healthcare team because of you know, more readily uh, available access to data streams and information that because, you know, we know the surgery is one piece of that patient journey, yeah. right? And patients are often interacting with other specialists, primary care providers, both pre and post. Um, they have surgical follow-ups, but only at certain times. Having information, you know, seamlessly and more readily available to other providers having the opportunity for patients to provide their own subjective input to that. So patient reported outcomes um, or you know, symptoms or things that are happening uh, post-surgery can be key in speeding up the identification of, you know, and heading off potentially bad outcomes afterwards. Um, it, it gives their care team the ability to have a heads up on that. Um, and it gives patients, I think, a better overall experience and building those aspects into, you know, the system, how it works, where it pushes data, making sure that those hooks are, are there and, and thought of uh, at the outset, I think is also an important outcome. You know, it's not, it's not just the, the stakeholders directly interacting with it, it's the, the patient and their experience of that system through the entire care continuum. I think, honestly, Melanie, I think that's the biggest thing, right? The the patient is, it has to be the number one value driver, right? It has to be valuable to the patient. That's why everybody in this industry is here. It's for the patient. So the surgeon, you know, the the perioperative staff, everybody else is, is, are, is there to make sure that the patient is doing well. So I 100% agree that the, the value has to be centered toward, you know, ultimately toward the patient. Yeah, there, there's tertiary benefits around for the surgeon to make ergonomics better or to make workflow faster, to make it more financially you know, feasible for a hospital. All of that, though, I, I couldn't agree more. It leads right to patient benefit. 100% agree. Um, it's, it's all about the patient, right? And, and it, um, I think another side benefit in addition to that is is economics of surgery. Mm -hmm. And as you start to reduce complication rates, which is great for patients, it also has a, a very uh, strong benefit of reducing the cost of surgery. You know, the, the hospital stays are expensive and um, the testing required when you do have a complication, it, it, it just balloons very quickly. So by raising the level of, of, of the standard of care and reducing complication rates, it's it's a it's a it's a win win. That's fantastic, and it sounds like from our conversation there there is a host and a, a wide range of of benefits and values that we're realizing some of these already. Um, we're clear about uh, what those benefits are for patients and healthcare providers um, and our systems, <laughs> if you will, um, in managing care and improving uh, patient care. Uh, but there's a lot more to come. Uh, and I, I'd like to then um, use that as a frame, maybe another topic area for us to discuss. That is, what are the, what are the challenges um, that we're faced with in bringing a lot of these solutions uh, to the market? And, and to patients to improve care. Uh, we talk a lot about tech, technical challenges and those are significant, of course, but there's a host of others, whether it's um, uh, specifically technical you know, hardware or software, uh, digital connectivity, uh, but also cost and macroeconomic challenges, whether it be regulatory or reimbursement considerations all have an effect. Um, I'm gonna ask, uh, I'm gonna, ask you just to hold your response for a second. I'm gonna ask Nicole if she could post the second poll, um, which is on this topic. And then I'm going to turn it back over to the panel. Uh, and again, you know, what are your thoughts on the significant challenges in br bringing digital surgical solutions uh, to the market? What's at the top of your mind right now? So I'll, I'll jump in this time first. <laughs> okay. Um, so I think, quite honestly, I think it's it's interoperability and data exchange. I think if we were to think uh, broadly about data exchange, you know, one in and out of hospitals, um, you know, two is you know to make sure that we're good stewards of the data that's collected. Um, three, making sure you know all of those 
the the data and and uh, sensors that we've talked about already today, you know, how do we make sure that all of that can be aggregated to to provide the best uh, patient benefit? You know, that that interoperability. Um, yeah, there, there's a whole bunch of standards out there that that enable you know data flow, but again, they're really difficult. And and as we bring on new data uh, sources, sometimes those uh, standards don't don't apply as much, right? For us, adv advanced visualization um, at, is a is a very data dense uh, mm -hmm. you know stream. So you know we're we're streaming you know gigabytes uh, per second here of you know 4K multi wavelength data. It's really difficult to say how do we how do we put that to a heart monitor, for example, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You know, it's so the, these types of things need to be contemplated. Um, but also, once once we can aggregate that data, what is it, and how do we actually deliver it back, right? Because you know, as we develop models offline, develop software offline, yeah, it's all everybody on here knows compliance and and all of that kind of thing. That's great. We're gonna we're gonna put it back down to the operating room, and we're gonna provide these models. What does it mean? And, and really, how do we how do we enable the perioperative staff and the surgeons to trust it? At what level do we need to do we need to be able to provide the data back to say, you know, as as we're telling you that there's an accident or a head up ahead or, or a critical structure up ahead, it's always a level of certainty. Is it seventy percent, eighty percent, ninety percent? And and what is it? Because quite honestly, we've done a number of studies internally. If you were to ask a hundred different surgeons where that critical structure is, that that ranges, you know. And it's, mm, it's typically mm -hmm. the, the level of agreement is is around you know eighty two to eighty seven mm. percent, depending on uh, at least in our studies, depending on the the critical structure that's there. So we have to be better than that, right? But it's uh, but it's a level of trust also that that needs to come along with it. So it sounds like there's a lot there from from the the, the physical connectivity uh, of the devices, the the acquisition, uh, transmission, and analysis of surgical video, um, and and then providing that information in an actual way in real time back into the OR. Bill and Melanie, what what are your thoughts? What as we think about bringing digital surgical solutions to market, what what's at the top of your mind? What what do you worry about the most? What do you, how, where do you tell your teams to focus? I, I mean, to follow on from what Tom just said, I think, you know, if you're not worried about the volume of data and how we turn that into actionable information and information that is useful and timely and that people trust, I think trust given the, you know, the high risk, high safety aspect of these situations is key. Um, so all of those, those aspects associated with the data, I think are very important. One thing, maybe you know, slightly off brand for the things I normally worry about, but one thing I, I do think about that's top of mind is, isn't just the interoperability of the, the data, but the, the ownership of it. I think mm -hmm. anytime you talk about digital health solutions in any industry, in any space, um, there's always a, there's always a discussion around you know how to how to monetize that how to make mm -hmm. that you know data stream useful and I think there's just there's a lot of open questions right now particularly in this industry about how we do that and how we do it in a way you know how it's managed in a way that ultimately presents the most benefit for patients. So, so there's also a, a data governance and data security element here that needs to be addressed. And of course, that's multi, there are multi factors that are affecting that. Bill, I see you shaking, shaking your head. Yeah. What, what are your thoughts? Well, I, I was going to talk about that. You know, the, the ownership of data is really key, but it's also patient uh, health information. Yeah. And that's, that's protected in a, in, for good reason, right? And we, we need to respect that. And um, understanding how to navigate those waters is a little tricky. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think it's also, you know, that ownership of data, um, every hospital has a different information system. And how do you couple into those, the infrastructure? Um, it, it, there's no standard there, right? And, and I think so how, collecting data, um, organizing it, 
connecting to the cloud, there's a lot of infrastructure that's needed to really deliver the, the grand vision that we're talking about here. Um, and you know, another piece and, and that I think is really important for this field is, and you know, uh, Melanie will, will be all over this as well, how do you present the information in a safe way? Um, it, there's, a, there's a human-centered design aspect of all of these digital assistants um, that's, that cannot be ignored, right? And, and I would go back again, again I love this analogy of, of these uh, navigation systems. If you have a navigation system in your car that isn't designed well, it doesn't have a, 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 the right kind of user interface, it can actually be more dangerous than helpful. You're trying to figure out which way am I supposed to be turning and you're looking at the screen, you're not looking at the road. I think the same thing is true when you say, when you have these digital assistants in the operating room, if it's not presented in the right way, if it's distracting, if it's reducing, you know, increasing the, the cognitive load required, that opens the door for more complications, not reducing complications. So I think we really have to think hard as an industry, as companies, as researchers, how do we design the interfaces so that it fits within the workflow of a procedure and, and, and really delivers the value um, that is possible. That's great. And I wanna come back to this topic of thinking through um, approaches to human-centered design uh, broadly, but in, in regard to you know, data, but um, what are your, some, some of your thoughts, Bill, and the rest of the panel on how should we be thinking about understanding um, what data is, is useful uh, and when that data and how that data should be presented to a surgeon or a surgical team. So it's the right data at the right time to the right person. Um, and it, how do we, how, what kind of construct should we be considering and in, in, in trying to you know, define the, 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 the problem before we come up with a solution? So I think, quite honestly, I think Melanie, this is this is, you know, softball for you here because, like, <laughs> you know, I think I, I, number one, you have to get the user involved. It has to be involved in definition and scoping of the solution of the of the problem, and then how do we how do we bring uh, the technology to it? So how do we, how do we bring the technology back to the user in such a way? But we really have to understand their workflow, the environment that they're in. Um, you know, I I often draw analogies between an OR and a, and like a, like a jet fighter airplane, right? There, you know, two, two spots that are, you know, going very fast, a lot of things going on and you're being presented with a lot of data and every decision you make is really, really important. So we can, we can look at how that type of data is presented in, in other, in other industries and in other uh, type situations, but it all goes back to the amount of studies that that have to be done in and around the user itself is is paramount. Yeah, and I, you know, one of the challenges with that, I, that's a it's a good analogy, Tom. The the jet fighter one. I started my career doing human factors for military systems, um, and where they sort of have it easier over us is standardization of operating procedures, right? Mm -hmm. If you fly jets for the Air Force, uh, you basically do that one, one way. Everyone who flies a certain type of jet uh, follows a similar protocol, and they do that one way. One of the things that, that we face as a challenge with applications like this is that clinical practice can vary, um, maybe not widely, but enough uh, from healthcare system to healthcare system, that sometimes it's challenging to understand, you know, fully that you know that workflow, that choreography, that that interplay um, that's going on during surgery, and you know what we want to make sure we don't do is is miss edge cases and you know things that maybe work in one situation because it's done a particular way in one system. Uh, but it's done differently in another. Um, but yes, back to Dean's original question, I think you're right. The only way to robustly address that is to is to get those stakeholders involved early. Um, and it is the surgeons and 
it's others too. It's, you know, purchasers within the hospital system. Uh, it's biomedical engineers, people who are maintaining systems like this, uh, worried about things like downtime and, and stuff like that. So just like in, in military systems, it's considering all those aspects um, for the people who use them, the people who maintain them, and the people who procure them as well. I, I, if I could, I'd, I'd build on that even further of uh, and really say an important partner as we move forward is our surgical societies. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, they, they bring um, the expertise on the, on the clinical side and even, you know, trying to like, we are, our digital surgery team, we have the touch surgery app. We teach people the process or the, the steps of performing a specific procedure. What are the phases, steps, and tasks of that? And we and then we record the video and are able to break that down using advanced algorithms automatically. But what you call each part of those those steps, what even the nomenclature of what is, you know, is it suturing here? Is it an ass? It, so some of the terms are well defined, but the process of you know, just the consistency between um, institutions across regions. Um, can be very different. And, and those are sort of barriers um, that prevent a more standardized approach. Um, so I think, I think it's important that we appreciate that there's regional differences, that we appreciate that there's different approaches and work to try and harmonize it, but also have interfaces that uh, are flexible enough to address those change differences. And Bill, is this an opportunity for industry to work closely with the surgical societies and tackling some of these, you know, complex standardization challenges? Absolutely. You know, I think again, th this big vision that we're talking about today—it's a—it requires an industry, <laughs> multiple um, industries, to really realize it. Um, obviously, the big medical device companies like Medtronic have an important part to play, but mm -hmm. smaller companies as well. And even, you know, you, you're going to see really small companies where they're building advanced digital apps that could be um, almost like a, your, your cell phone, be able to, to run on a, a platform um, that's within an OR. I think there's a, an ecosystem in that way as well of development, mm -hmm. but the clinical expertise uh, through those surgical societies has to be a partner um, just for the very reasons we talked about. It has to be integrated into the OR and be safe and effective. Well, that's great. We'll, we'll make sure next time we do this, we, we have some panelists from all of the surgical societies so we, we can really talk about maybe um, activation of some of these great ideas. Uh, but uh, from what you've described, it, it also sounds like that um, standardization is absolutely critical to bring AI uh, and realize the promise of AI uh, into the surgical suite. Is that right as well? Short answer, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, all right, we're going to... Um, uh, shift a little bit and, and well, maybe continue our discussion on human-centered design. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Nicole if uh, you would post our third and final poll uh, to the audience and let them vote. And this question is, uh, what are the best approaches to using human-centered design to improve surgical performance and outcomes? And there's a range of methodologies and, and approaches, but would love to hear from the panel picking up on our conversation already about this topic. Are there particular methodologies? And I would love to hear your thoughts in particular about simulation and modeling, whether that be uh, in the human factors lab uh, or in um, using digital models to look at the impact of using a, a product or a suite of products um, and understanding the downstream or maybe even the upstream effects of, of how the use of a product is gonna drive outcomes. What are your thoughts? Um, so I, I can start with this one. Uh, and, you know, in direct response to the poll question, what I would say, I think all of those things that were listed there are important methodologies and techniques, but I would, I would bring that up a level even and say the most critical thing to do 
is to take a, a complex systems view of how we develop these things. And so we are thinking, we're using all of those, those tools and methodologies, of course, but at the highest level, we're thinking about this ecosystem holistically, you know, the, the hardware, the software, the data flows, the interfaces, um, and, you know, not developing, you develop each of these things uh, sort of in isolation, or you take it as a subsystem and you bring it off and you do the development. When you bring those back, you get sort of that Christmas tree effect, right? Where you've just got a whole bunch of disparate things hung off of one platform, but that maybe don't work in concert with each other and you're not realizing the benefit that, that ultimately you want. So um, I, I think that's, you know, that's critical for any sort of human-centered development um, is, is that systems thinking and having the, having the, the humans at the center of that. Um, more specifically, though, what, what you're asking about, Dean, with regards to modeling and simulation, I think that's going to be a huge area. I see training uh, as one of the one of the biggest hurdles, you know, as these type of systems proliferate and we are lacking in sort of, you know, standards like operability standards across different types of technology applications and platforms that that steep learning curve is a big barrier to adoption for a lot of these things. And so anything we can do to, to bring that down is gonna be very important. And I see modeling and simulation um, as a big one. So being able to you know, model tortuous anatomy in ways that gives surgeons the ability to practice and come up to speed more quickly and safely um, that's going to be critical and less costly uh, than you know some of the ways that it's it's done now. So, um, a short answer: yes, I think that's very important. <laughs> Indeed, I think, I think building on that a little bit, Melanie is is I love the complex systems approach. I think I think that makes all the sense in the world. And in terms of modeling simulation, you know, we we have some amazing tools in our toolbox now, uh, you know, in the last, let's say five to 10 years, 3D printing, right? You know, things that, things that in, we used to have to send out to a machine shop and wait four weeks for it to come back. You know, we can now print overnight uh, or even sooner. And, and I think kind of really bringing that complex systems perspective of rapid iteration, but really being able to bridge that mind gap of saying, this is what it could be let me put something in your hands and try it out, right? You know, that type of simulation where you actually have something in your hands. We can go all the way to digital simulations where you're actually immersing yourself into a virtual OR. Like that is that is amazing. And it and it probably starts to touch on some of those regional variabilities that Bill was speaking to is, you know, maybe these type of ORs are smaller. Or they don't have, they have different equipment, um, different capabilities, as opposed to, you know, these, you know, large learning centers with large robotic rooms and things like that, you know. So we, there's, there's a continuum of simulation all the way from, you know, you think about it and you draw it on a whiteboard to you have parts in your hands that are rapid, you know, rapid prototyped to go all the way to a, a digital environment. Uh, again, really early days, I think on the, on the full digital environment, but a massive, a massive value when we start kind of getting that user input and uh, and being able to train through it. You know, I, Dean, I'm going to not go toward the simulation side. I okay. think there's a step that we need to we need to as an industry get better at, mm -hmm. which is bringing human centered design user experience. Um, I, I would say on equal footing as as. Uh, safety and performance hmm. and um and you know it, obviously we've been trained as medical device uh professionals though performance is you know we we need to be able to perform the, the the surgical tasks and we have to do it safely and effectively um the, the, those are pounded into our head every day with through training <laughs> right. and, and and it's rightfully so right that's yeah. what we need to have as our foundation but I think these user usability aspects, because our systems are becoming more and more complex, as more data is coming in, 
it, you know, they're, they're, it's no longer a simple handheld device. Now it's 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 that plus um, what you're seeing on the screen. You know, Tom's uh, companies providing that additional visualization, um, bringing in auditory information from other. You know, there, there's a lot thrown at people, and um, and we need to bring that into the beginning stages of our concept development mm -hmm. and think about that earlier in our processes. And, and, and one of the challenges that I've seen with this is it's hard to define a metric of what is a good interface. Um, if you've got a performance requirement that says, hey, this needs to move 100 millimeters a second. And if you're 92, you fail. If, if you're 102, you're good. What is a good interface? What you know, mm -hmm. it's it's and and because it's gray like that, it's it's sometimes um, easy to dismiss. We got to launch this product. We can't do that. I, that. That would be a mistake, in my opinion. And and so I think part of what we need to do about human centered design is come up with metrics where we can have it be on the same level as as uh, performance and safety. And, and at what point in the in the development process should we be addressing these things from the from the get-go from the very very early stages totally <laughs> that's an easy one yeah, uh, yeah that's I an think, easy yeah. one from the very beginning and and you know what would be a constructive approach is it even engaging your intended users in this in conceptual considerations and presenting them even before you have a prototype or anything they can get their hands on is it is it describing what the product or the solution or the platform is and what it's intended to do and getting the responses and what are some ways to to kind of de-risk the process and assure that we're addressing the things that matter the most. Yeah, totally. You know, engaging stakeholders very early in the process, getting them involved in generating design inputs long before we've even started, you know, concept production is important. Um, and it's difficult because, you know, humans are pretty good at responding to something you put in front of them. They're not as good at, you know, the abstract sort of conceptualizing things um, for themselves. You know, sometimes they, they can't even conceive of what is possible. Um, and there's a number of, of ways to get around that. You know, the biggest one is it, our observational and ethnographic research mm -hmm. techniques, right? We watch what they do as opposed to what they tell us, or I should say not as opposed to, but in addition to what they tell us, sometimes the richest source of information about, you know, unmet needs are things like workarounds. Um, when you observe how people actually execute on certain tasks and the way in which they do their job, which maybe deviates from standard operating procedures or protocols, they, they don't even realize anymore ways in which they're compensating for technology deficiencies, right? They just do these things as a matter of course. And if you ask them about it, um, they probably wouldn't report on it because they don't know they, they don't realize that that's what they're doing but when you see it happening it's a really rich source of information um, and there you know there's all there's loads of techniques for how you can kind of probe with folks to get information about these unmet needs or you know unanswered areas that you know they, maybe they're not actively thinking about even before you've got things for them to react to, prototypes for them to react yeah. to. And, and um, to pick up and on Bill. If, if, if I could, go ahead, just to go back to, you ask about modeling and simulation. Yeah. That's where I could see where you've got AR, VR. You, you, could, you could, that's a way to do these types of, of workflow analysis, the usability aspects of, or don't require any hardware to be built, mm -hmm. but you can learn a lot from those. And I, I yeah. think that's a tool that we could use. Interesting. And Bill, to get back to another point you made about cognitive performance, it sounds like it's really important that we consider and, and include some cognitive measures in addition to the, the physical human choreography um, as well in some, whether it's digital modeling or more hands-on iterative design, is, is that right? 
Uh, to totally. <laughs> and, and, and I think, as I said, it, it, as we get these ecosystems of, of digitally connected um, ORs and, and um, in event, interventional suites and, you know, it's, healthcare happens everywhere now. Um, as we start to bring in more and more, I think um, it's, it's a place where we have to think about, you know, how, how are people processing this information? And, and how it, are they going to, is it actionable for them? Mm -hmm. Is it, it, again, providing the right information at the right time in the right way? It's, it's, a, it's a central piece of the way we need to work as an industry now. Indeed, indeed. And um, this has uh, been a tremendous discussion. And I'm just recognizing that we have a few minutes left. I, I want to give uh, a few minutes to some, uh, we have a few questions, and I, I want to turn them over to the panel. But before I do that, um, Nicole, I wanted to ask if you are able to post the uh, poll results um, on the screen, or is that Oh, there we go. Okay, thank you. So just a quick review of question one. Um, everyone was uh, very, very focused on 40, 42% of the respondents focus on outcomes um, as being the most important uh, way to uh, that uh, digital surgic solutions make a difference, followed up by providing comprehensive patient data and insights. And that actually uh, raises a uh, one of the questions that came out of the Q&A, and that is, is breaking down the data silos uh, in the OR and the hospital um, a prerequisite for bringing digital surgical solutions? That is, do we need to break down proprietary uh, data protection? Uh, do we need to make all of the data coming off of the devices essentially open source? Is that a prerequisite or, or can we bring solutions in without having to have open source data from all of the, the devices and monitors and robots uh, in and around surgery? I think from, I mean, I can speak from what Active is doing, Dean. Uh, I don't think that we have to wait for that to happen. I think we can be a catalyst to help it happen. Um, and I think when we show the value of an aggregated data set across multiple devices, across multiple companies, you know, different industries, whatever, whatever, what have you, um, then that'll only drive more influence to, to make these data sets, uh, whether it's open source or not, or, or at least shareable. Um, you know, we spoke earlier about, uh, data ownership. Sometimes it's not ownership, maybe it's access. Right. And then those are two very different things. Uh, so I wouldn't say that that we have to wait for these barriers to be taken down. For example, active, we we kind of went in there and we we started our own data collection uh, bit to make sure that uh, that we can have access to this and then be able to share that across. We're working with a lot of kind of tech partners to make sure that we're doing this the right way. You know, the tech industry has years ahead of medical device in their mm -hmm. experience. And they've done it really, really well in a lot of cases, not all cases, but in a lot of cases. So it, we can learn from that. Um, but I don't think we, I don't think we need to wait. I don't, I don't think anybody likes waiting. No, I think, I think there are definitely some opportunities where we can have a, a small amount of connectivity and have a big impact. Mm -hmm. So we need, we need to do that now. Um, you know, I think another question that comes into my mind is, or, or, or a future direction I think we need to be heading is understanding we're going to share data between devices. And, and I agree with what, how you preface the question, whoever posted it, is, is uh, you know, it, it, there's a lot of proprietary information that companies are hesitant to, to bulge. Well, that I don't, I don't have to provide all the data that I collect, but maybe there's a certain amount of data that is critical, like heart rate or from our pace, the pacemaker, or maybe it's um, you know, uh, basic kinematic data from the robot. You wouldn't be able to reverse engineer that, but it would enable um, you know, that ecosystem to, to develop. So understanding the, the amount of data to share, I think is an important thing to think about. Very good. And I have, an, I have another question uh, for you regarding um, communication systems. Is there a need for 5G uh, in digital surgery? We haven't talked about telesurgery or remote, 
but what are your thoughts, whether it's 5G for private networks in and around the, the surgical suite or the hospital, or to enable remote access for training or even telesurgery itself? What are your thoughts? I think 5G will be the largest or one of the biggest enabling technologies in the next 10 years. Uh, private 5G, we'll probably start with private 5G and get to a, a you know, a big network backbone, but, um, in, you know, Bill and Melanie, I'm sure you have insight here, but I, I am very excited to see more rollout of 5G, um, in remote areas, uh, this, this data pipeline is, you know, that, that we're all talking about. We need we need something there. We need the infrastructure there to get more data out and be able to bring high bandwidth, low latency data back in. Five G, by its spec, fixes this. Uh, I'm really excited for it. And is I this think there's there, there's other aspects. And obviously, five G is is very low latency, high bandwidth, which is needed when you're talking about these complex real time systems where you're making decisions based on the data. But, but there's other aspects of the wireless technology that are really interesting too, like the localization capabilities. Um, you know, being able to find where a piece of equipment is within, an, within the hospital, being able to understand where equipment is within the, the operating room itself, where is that robot arm relative to the camera? Um, and then even at the micro level where you can start to understand where instruments are. And, and so the, there, there's pieces of wireless that are beyond the, just the communications. Fantastic. Uh, well, I see that we're running out of time um, and uh, we have some other questions uh, that we're just not gonna be able to get to. Uh, Nicole will, um, and we haven't re reviewed the other poll results. Will the, will the other poll results um, be available on the website? Oh, there we go. Uh, so there's question two, uh, and what are the sm most significant challenges? Um, digital connectivity uh, and software, uh, again, came up as uh, leading challenges, very consistent with what we've just been talking about. Uh, so that's great. And can we see the final poll result, please? What are the best approaches to uh, human-centered design? All of the above. <laughs> so again, uh, great thoughts and simulation and modeling um, was mentioned uh, as well as one of the leads there. So before we run out of time, uh, I'd like just to uh, thank our panel uh, and Mass Medic. Uh, so Bill, Tom and Melanie, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts. I know that we could continue to uh, have a long discussion about so many other things, but uh, I have learned a lot uh, just uh, listening uh, to you all as you've uh, added your thoughts and uh, answers to these questions uh, as uh, well as uh, uh, so many other topics that we have discussed along the way. And I'm looking to uh, forward to continuing our discussions uh, in the future. So thank you very much uh, to our panel and to Mathematic and to our audience. Uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks so much, everybody, for joining us. Thank you again to PA Consulting for sponsoring this great discussion today. Um, please make sure to go to massmedic.com to check out all of our upcoming events. Um, and keep in mind that you can sponsor these conversations as well if you have a topic that would be relevant to our broader membership. We cannot do these great educational sessions without support from you. Thank you. Have a great day.